Well, the main is a very special day named Magda Puja, and then, uh, of course, all the ceremony, the offering of the new sala, and the casting of the Prabhatan, the Buddha Rupa. This is a, a lot for one one day, full moon in February. Uh, 1,250 arhats assembled spontaneously, pay respects to the Buddha. <laughs> and then we had this wonderful, dramatic... Party Mocha with the wind blowing and <laughs> uh, so I'll be leaving this evening and uh, you know I think it's uh, it's a uh, past few days here at Alan Chat this uh, sense of uh, you know the kind of period from when when I first came here in 1975 and up to this present time is uh, amazing to see what's happened and uh, we recognize that it's rather unique monastery because it <coughs> it's the only one I know of where the uh, majority are uh, international Sangha uh, you know western mostly western or uh, monks from from Europe, Asia, from Australia and uh, the Americas, and then many from uh, Asian countries, mixed with the Thai. So this is, uh, you know, to me it's quite significant, and Nana Chat means international. <clears throat> and at this time, uh, this may be a hopeful sign in the world, of, you know, an auspicious sign, uh, because uh, you know, on an international level, there's always conflict and uh, prejudices and political problems and economic problems and racial views and opinions that uh, class identities and whatnot that kind of human beings tend to, uh, you know, out of ignorance, out of not understanding Dhamma, they make endless. Uh, complicated conditions around <clears throat> just uh, where you were born or what you look like or the color of your skin or whatever so so this is uh, a sign you know of where these all these uh, issues of of race and class and nationality are no longer of any significance to our life and we're committed to the, the same uh, precept level the uh, Bhikkhu Vinaya and then the uh, practice uh, we're all committed to uh, the same <clears throat> goal liberation from ignorance and so this is a universal goal it's uh, you know it's not not about uh, you know it's not personal it's not uh, racial or national or anything it's uh, when you think of liberation that's what everybody longs for you know no matter where they are who they are Liberation from suffering or ignorance or whatever words you want to use. But if you really uh, contemplate the dukkha of this realm, you know, it is a realm of suffering. Uh, and I, you know, for many years being from my background, I didn't like, particularly like to think of it like that. Uh, you know, one, one uh, thinks it's a bit of a depressing uh, way of looking at life. You know, it's all suffering and and that, but when you, you know, examine it, investigate it in terms of, of the way the Buddha encouraged us, we see it for what it is. It's not a realm to attach to. There's nothing in this realm, in the human form or in the uh, conditioned realm <clears throat> that we're experiencing at this time that can give us any permanent security, safety, liberation of any sort. Maybe momentary pleasure is about the best we can expect. So uh, uh, when we re this really sinks in, then we 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 don't demand that. We're not looking for the impossible uh, conditions because uh, we know that they're impossible, and so we we learn to live our lives in this reflective style. And then the Buddhist monastic form is a form that is you know, based on alms mendicancy, on contentment. And this uh, word contentment is very 
important to me because I see so many problems in the Sangha, uh, in, you know, in the West, in England, for example, or other places, is that uh, very few pe- very few monks or nuns ever really find contentment. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's always a striving for something, wanting a better or something better than what they have, something more. And uh, <clears throat> they can always, you can always imagine something better than what you have. Even if you have the best, you can always imagine it being better than the best. <laughs> Which I don't think is possible. Uh, best, is, you can't get beyond that. But, but the mind, you know, the thinking mind will create uh, even the ridiculous absurdities of better than the best. And so that's the thinking mind. The thinking mind is not to be believed in or attached to but recognized. And we use our thinking mind in it with wisdom rather than with just desire and ignorance and per- expressing personal views and and uh, biases and and that that we tend to use our thoughts and our speech to to create endless conflicts within our own minds and then in the uh, society we live in. So this uh, this sundo in Thai they say me sundo that's highly regarded in Thai <coughs> value system. And as a way of saying something very, some making a very ultimate compliment to a Thai, as in, me son don't know, it means he's enlightened, really. <laughs> and, and that is, uh, that, but that is not a uh, quality that uh, is uh, recognized in the West as being very important. In fact, you know, from my background, it means that you're kind of stupid uh, if you're content. <laughs> And therefore, you, you know, like an animal chewing grass is content, you know, contented cows in Switzerland, you know, in the Alps and things like that. Or, <laughs> because, they, you know, they're not terribly, they don't think a lot and they don't create problems. <laughs> but, but we do, we're, we're, you know, we're cursed with a thinking mind, complicated patterns of thought and memory. And, and it is, uh, it's a very confusing, <clears throat> complicated life that we have to live as human beings. And the, then it's the Dhamma practice, meditation, is bringing it down to simplicity again. You know, if you really uh, understand what mindfulness, satisapachanya, really is, you know, under, you know, develop it, it's ultimate simplicity. It's just, it's the ability we have in the present to let go of everything and just be totally present, open, to the way it is, and there's nothing grasping, no grasping, no demand, no criticism being made. It's just the ability to to embrace the totality of a moment in consciousness uh, that we begin to recognize the uh, escape from suffering, the path of through samaditi, right understanding, in which we can get out of the trap, out of the vicious circle. Uh, the vortex of the thinking, emotional, uh, conditioned realm that we we tend to be uh, lost, overwhelmed by. So uh, today, the you know the, the uh, Kudmer Bao, she came. She was one of the um, supporters that helped make uh, the last uh, the, my reign and my brief reign at Wat Nanachat. Uh, uh, she, she was the one that <clears throat> came when, and we had just this grass roof, uh, sala, you know, and just a very primitive, um, place that, uh, you know, with bamboo, uh, things, you know, we had sat on bamboo and then the floor was dirt, dirt floor. We put mats on it. Yeah, I quite liked it actually. It was, uh, you know, not particularly, uh, hungry for glamorous uh, salads, but so and some of these more primitive things are quite pleasing to to an eye like mine, you know, it's kind of basic and you can't really 
do that in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> uh, you can't, you know, one doesn't ever think of making a salad like that. But anyway, it was like one of these freak days when uh, Mayor Pao and a group of people from Bangkok, and it's, uh, there was this uh, uh, kind of uh, well-known personality, Nai Akom, who, who was like a D DJ or a disc jockey on the uh, Air Force radio, Soon Nung. And uh, he was very, very charming, very outgoing, uh, kind of loved by the people in general. And, and uh, Mel Bao was very connected with him because her husband was an Air Force general. And, and so they'd go around the country looking for uh, starving monks, poor monasteries, these kind of society ladies and get in coaches and go off to Mae Hong Son or some remote place just to find some uh, destitute monastery and then they'd rush back to Bangkok, raise the money and buy the, the things to take an offer as a papa, as a donna offering. And so Lung Pao Cha told them about us. You know, we, <laughs> at that time we were, we were very, very poor. And so, uh, and the day they came, the, the coaches came up in, uh, in the morning, uh, up the road, and, and immediately when they got out of the uh, coach, it started raining, you know, and it was uh, a freak rainstorm, because it's not supposed to rain that time of the year. <laughs> and it rained very hard, and they all rushed into this grass roof cellar, you see, and then they're all huddled in there looking at and they and of course the thought comes in, oh, they need a salai. <laughs> and they started raising funds right in front of me. And of course the villagers thought was, uh, my wife was performing some magic trick. <laughs> I swear I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Man, it was, uh, it was auspicious. And of course then my Akom, one time he, he even, uh, you know, this is when I went, was in England. He was even active in raising funds for Amravati. And so he, he one year he promised to a million baht. So, and you know, I just didn't really think about it much. And then I came the next year and, and I'm sitting in the sala at Nanachat and Nai Akom comes in and drops a bag of Bot, a million bot right in front of me. <laughs> I didn't count it, but I just think, <laughs> assumed it was. But yeah, well, you know, this, uh, and Mayor Bao is, is one of these people who, uh, you know, only Thailand can produce, I think, <laughs> where they, uh, they just love to tumble and make merit and get such joy out of it. And so uh, she, it's she and Nai Akom and her husband and the Thai Air Force was very much responsible for building the previous cella, which is now no longer existing. And so when we, when I went to see Mayor Bao before going to uh, Ratanawan a few weeks back, I invited her to come here for this ceremony. And she's not very well, as you can see. She used to be very robust, active, energetic woman, but she's had health problems and now confined to wheelchair. And but she she seemed determined then to come. And I thought, you know, I, oh, she po wouldn't couldn't possibly do that. But she she was here this morning, and so it was very uh, joyful thing to have this continuity and uh, appreciation from the sangha for someone like that, who you know, an old woman who is who has spent so much of her life. Uh, supporting the Sangha uh, in, the, in the way that she knows how. So, uh, this is a good image for her. You know, all these monks, you know, many of the Ajans from different branch monasteries, and then all of you coming here for this event, uh, kind of a way of expressing our appreciation and gratitude for the generosity that we receive. And so with contentment, you know, we 
this this is a, the purpose of this life, you know, what an alms mendicant, why did the Buddha establish a monastic order on alms mendicancy, on begging, on some being totally dependent on somebody else, on lay community for basic uh, requisites, you know, why, why, how could he have done that? And, uh, of course, the amazing thing that it works, you know, 2,554 years, and we're sitting here right now, our lives depend on that alms. And, uh, and so this is, this is, uh, this kind of goes against the whole cultural, uh, attitude, uh, of the West. Uh, you know, you've got to have security through money in the bank and, uh, you know, look out for yourself and make sure you've got loads of security, material financial security. So in Dhamma, you're really going against the whole flow of the worldly tendencies. That in this time, the society, economics, the political economic conditions all over, in the Asia, Europe, or wherever, is, is very much materialistic and about uh, you know, economic progress and and abundance and getting more and more. Uh, and so then, um, then of course, nobody wants to admit the fact that it's not going to be that way. You know, the signs are there. Uh, the, the other side is happening, the, the decay, the, the degeneration. Now, as, uh, as uh, alms mendicants, we you know, because we, of, of our life, we're no longer, you know, dependent on uh, a, an affluent society or a, uh, you know, a booming economy. Uh, so we can survive in, in the various economic bubbles and crashes and depressions that happen uh, in, in uh, our lives as we live here in Thailand or in England or wherever. <coughs> So that means that, that you know, uh, the more you kind of train yourself, you know, it's not, you know, from from a middle class kind of background uh, where your life is based on material comfort and, and uh, a kind of taking for granted a certain level of material uh, necessity to living in this very simple way where you know, rice in the alms bowl, uh, robes made from rags and uh, shelter for the night and uh, basic medicinal substances, four requisites. And then we always get better than that. So we have beautiful sala with a polished granite floor and made a beautiful Buddha Rupa today. And we, uh, you know, this is to be appreciated. Uh, and and acknowledge that our life is really, you know, the the nitty gritty of our monastic life is just the uh, alms food and the the robe and the shelter and the medicine. So then, uh, so then we we can also re become aware of our own. our own discontentment, you know, the way we we do grumble and complain and and you know, we, we nature is to to complain and grumble and criticize. So it's uh, you know, I mean I um, my first few years of monasticism I, I made a strong determination to not grumble because I I am uh, my cultural conditioning is grumbling. I spent four years in the military where, you know, even before that, uh, you know, we were, I wasn't so bad a grumbler, but four years in the American Navy. In the Navy, you just grumble about everything. And, <laughs> and so, and this kind of influenced me in, in, in because it's supported by the society, you know, being critical, finding fault with yourself or uh, who you live with or the place you're in or the society you live in. 
And so I made a determination, an aditana, not to grumble. <clears throat> and I'm trying to keep that uh, throughout my monastic life. So, you know, in what I pulled in the early days, where I couldn't understand, you know, most of what's going on, and so when I found this inner grumbling, uh, kind of whinging, grumbling, unpleasantness inside me, and and so I, you know, but I determined not to, to develop that or to believe it or to, or do anything but recognize it, to you know, not to even suppress it, but to use it as a way of, of developing, cultivating uh, mindfulness, and to let go of the very conditions that make one's life so uh, unhappy, even in the midst of. A lot of pleasure and beauty, and and like today, when I think of a day like this, there's so much to be grateful for. So many good people coming together, so many uh, good things happening all at once to us in in one day. You know, and it, uh, and yet I'm sure um, critical thoughts have gone through some of your minds now and then. <laughs> And complaints and that, and so this is just the the way of our humanity is to, you know, because we do, we can always imagine being better or somebody else, you know, blaming somebody or oneself. And so this mindfulness is our ability to tune into that, observe it, and uh, not be the caught into it, to determine, to recognize it. Because suppressing it is, does not help. It just makes it worse. And so it's not like kind of pretend that you're content or act like, you know, you, you, you know, that you don't feel grumpy or complaining. But it's using the, these tendencies that we actually develop the path. And whatever we have to work with, whatever characters we have, uh, you know, both on their positive or negative <clears throat> manifestations, they are the path for us. And so, uh, you know, we're the knower of these conditions rather than the conditions themselves. So, and just this encouragement towards, you know, the beauty of the monastic form, this particular tradition, Theravada tradition, and then as we <clears throat> developed it from Lung Po Cha and his, as is our kind of our, our exemplary father figure. And, uh, so, because he was a very, you know, powerful, uh, monk who, who had this kind of joy. Uh, you know, when you lived with him, you could feel his, his contentment and joy as a way his, his mind actually manifested. He manifested this through his, uh, you know, through his body and speech. <clears throat> and yet he was fully human. He wasn't like goody good or, you know, <laughs> trying to be nice about everything. But he, you know, you felt something at a deeper and deeper level. There was a real purity of mind that he recognized and cultivated. And so this is, is to remind you that, that this is what our, what we're here for, what the aim of this life is all about. And, and then we, you know, no matter, you know, then we're all aiming at the same goal. You know, so I just assume that all of you and myself are here for liberation from ignorance. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Uh, and so I wanted to make that very clear that, that that's our common bond, you know. That's where oh, there's no problem around that. And then, then, then there, you know, there are so many misunderstandings just on personal reactions or, or you know, emotional <coughs> reactions to each other. We all have our particular hang-ups and and uh, difficult emotional habits, but. Remember the goal, and 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 that you know, like the Buddha Rupa, the one that they cast today, 
Uh, see that? You know, kind of develop that when it's uh, the masala and they bring it. You know, kind of determined to use that form as a reminder. So it's not just about, oh, isn't it nice or beautiful or things like that, but to, not to just see it, uh, you know, as some kind of art object or that, but to, you know, develop that image of Bhutto or Buddha as a reminder. So that, and then when, you know, when we see each other, the, the monastic form, you know, the shaven head and the robe, <clears throat> you know, we can see uh, see this as the Sangha uh, rather than this monk and that monk, junior monk, senior monk, and I like this one, don't like that one. And then it gets personal and, and we have our own personal preferences and opinions about each other. <clears throat> but one one thing, you know, the point of having the same kind of robe and and the shaven head is because it does diminish, takes away the, the eccentric, unique individual uh, aspects that we tend to, uh, you know, be identified with and hold on to in, if we weren't ordained in the, as Buddhist monks. And then Sangha then is seen from this, no, no longer as so personally, you know, in such a personal way, and and uh, and our own emotional feelings about each other have we can see them for what they are, so that you know this this sense of sangha, the the monastic form, the bhikkhu, is like a symbol for that. What the supatipano, ujupatipano. <clears throat> so this way you have, you know, if you use these these forms properly, then they're, they're reminders that you don't attach to them, you're not, you know, you're not trying to uh, grasp them or make, or or just dismiss them, but use them. Therefore, mindfulness and wisdom, developing the path. So, I offer this. My voice is wearing out. <laughs> so, it's telling me to shut up. <laughs>